this is the underworld, different from reality. Huh? Where am I? It seems another lost, pitiful lamb has appeared today. Excuse me, where is this place? Whoa, this, this is... If you want to return to the upper world, you have no choice but to solve this problem. Not really? Well, what is this? The left side seems to be a three-dimensional space. What about the right side? It looks like it corresponds to the left side. This is quite a tricky problem. Oh, it looks like we have a hint from the start this time. That's good. Ah, uh, this is... What does it mean? This is a good hint. No, I don't understand it at all. Please explain it. I guess I have no choice. Numbers have a role as functions in the underworld. A role in the underworld? Now let's consider a function like this with a as a constant. Hmm, I see. This function f sub a seems to multiply x by a. That's correct. Here, let's call this function the a times function, and we'll write f sub a as a dot. This dot is a type of placeholder, meaning a value can be placed here. Then a corresponds to a dot. a corresponds to the a times function. I don't really get what you're aiming for, but understood for now. That was for the one-dimensional case, but what about the two-dimensional case? Uh, this seems to represent a two-dimensional vector. Could a vector also play the role of a function? Earlier we considered the a times function, so if we think similarly, just like multiplying numbers, we should be able to multiply vectors together. Yes, that's a good thought. Let's consider the dot product of vectors here. The dot product is calculated by summing the products of their components. In other words, you just need to multiply a1 by x1, multiply a2 by x2, and then add those values. Let's redefine vectors a and x like this. Do we define the a times function the same way as before? I'll give it a try! Here, let's consider the function f sub a as taking the dot product with vector a. If we use the previous notation and write f sub a as a dot, then vector a corresponds to a dot. With this, we've defined the role of vectors in the underworld. By the way, this dot appears to represent the dot product, so strictly speaking, it might be a little different in meaning from the previous dot, well, let's not worry about the details. Also, the value of the dot product is a number, not a vector. So you might not feel willing to call this an a times function. But for convenience, we'll also call this the a times function here. Understood? By the way, this can be thought of in the same way for the general n-dimensional case. The dot product of two n-dimensional vectors is also defined as the sum of the products of their respective components. Here we'll consider the right side as the upper world, and the left side as the underworld. Hmm, I kinda get it, but I kinda don't. Why are we even calculating the dot product here in the first place? Why does calculating the dot product have anything to do with the underworld? I'd like an explanation for that part. Well, it's natural to wonder about it. Then, let me give an intuitive explanation. Sundaman, do you remember the transpose of a matrix? Ah, now that you mention it, I do remember that. Transposing a matrix means switching its rows and columns. In other words, flipping it with respect to its diagonal. For example, the transpose of this matrix A would look like this. Here the rows become columns, and the columns become rows. You remembered well. Now, what about the transpose of a vector? Ah, uh, well, if we consider this column vector A as a one-column matrix and transpose it, it becomes a row vector. Exactly, transposing a vector turns a column vector into a row vector. Using this, we can calculate the dot product of vectors. Huh? What do you mean? Let's say we have two vectors A and B. Then if we multiply the transpose of A by B, since A is a column vector, it becomes a row vector. If we consider this as matrix multiplication, we just need to multiply A1 by B1, multiply A2 and B2, and then add those values. To be precise, we're treating a 1 by 1 matrix as a number here. And this matches the dot product of A and B. Oh, I understand now. So that means... The correspondence between vector A and the A times function... Can also be seen as the correspondence between A and its transpose. In short, this was just the correspondence between the column vector and the row vector. Intuitively, you could think of it that way. And here's where things get scary. What's gonna happen? Up until now we've been talking about finite dimensions, but strange things happen in infinite dimensions. Now let's assume A is an infinite dimensional vector. Even if you say it's strange, isn't it just about matching A with A dot? Hmm, so that's how you think. Then let's actually use this A times function. This A times function, applied to an infinite dimensional vector. 
results in something like this. Here, the products of the respective components are being summed. It doesn't seem problematic. Is that really the case? For example, consider the dot product of two infinite dimensional vectors like this. Then the result of the calculation becomes an infinite sum of ones, which diverges to positive infinity. Ha, huh, what happened? There are other cases where it can diverge to negative infinity or oscillate. One might consider accepting these as valid results, but in a sense it would mean the calculation isn't feasible. So we'd like to avoid such situations for now. As a simple method to avoid this, there's the idea of narrowing the space. For example, these vectors are infinite dimensional, but all components except the finite number are zero. Then the dot product results in a finite value. Great, problem solved. It feels like the space has gotten much narrower, but you can have a hundred or even thousand non-zero components. This is a space broader than any finite dimensional space. Wait, what's wrong? If this vector has all but a finite number of components as zero, then even if the other vector has any value, the dot product can still be calculated as a finite value. What could this possibly mean? It seems you've realized something incredible. What is the mysterious vastness of this space? To answer that, the simple way of thinking so far has its limits. We need to properly define what we've been calling the underworld. The underworld is known in mathematical terms as the dual space. The dual space can be defined for a general type of vector space, but for now as before, let's consider the space of numerical vectors of real numbers as an example. This sounds difficult. That's true. From here it's gonna be quite complex, so be prepared. The A times function we've been dealing with has a property called linearity. Linearity consists of two properties. First, the distributive law holds in the calculation of the dot product. If we rewrite it using f sub a it looks like this. In other words whether you add x and y first and then map them with f sub a, or map x and y individually with f sub a, and then add the results, the outcome remains the same. That's what it means. Also, in the calculation of the dot product, a scalar multiple of a vector can be taken out. Similarly, if we rewrite this using f sub a, it looks like this. This means that whether you multiply x by an arbitrary constant c and then map it with f sub a, or map it with f sub a and then multiply by c, the result doesn't change. These two properties of the a times function together are called linearity. Now, let's shift our thinking from the fact that the a times function satisfies linearity, and Instead of considering the A times function, what if we consider all functions satisfying linearity? What do you mean? Assume there is a function f that maps vectors to numbers, and that it satisfies linearity. Then, in the n-dimensional space we've been considering so far, in other words for the n-dimensional Euclidean space, we consider the space formed by all functions like f that satisfy linearity. This is called the dual space and it's represented by adding star to the original space's name. Now, numerical vectors can be said to correspond to functions that exist in the dual space. In fact, this correspondence is one-to-one -one in the finite dimensional case. But, in the infinite dimensional case, it is not one-to-one, -one, and the dual space is known to be broader than the original space. Here, R infinity refers to the space we considered earlier, the space of all infinite dimensional vectors, where all but a finite number of components are zero. Hmm, I see. I'm starting to vaguely understand what happened earlier. In the upper world, there is a condition that all but a finite number of components are zero. But in the underworld, that condition doesn't exist. And a broader world expands. This is exactly an example of the infinite dimensional dual space being broader than the original space. We're starting to see what it really is. Ah, I hadn't explained this yet. But just like numerical vectors, functions can also be added together or multiplied by constants. For example, if f and g are functions that map vectors to numbers, then the function f plus g is defined as a function that maps a vector x to the number f of x plus g of x. Here by the addition of numbers on the right side, the addition of functions on the left side is defined. So take note of that. Similarly, the function cf, which is the function f multiplied by a constant c, is defined as a function that maps a vector x to the number cf of x. Again, by multiplying the number on the right side by a constant, the constant multiplication of the function on the left side is defined. I hadn't really thought about that. 
I kind of understand what the dual space is, and I have a question. Just like how the reverse of the reverse is the front, I'm curious if the dual of the dual returns to the original. When you take the transpose of a column vector, it becomes a row vector. And taking the transpose again, returns it to a column vector. So, doesn't that mean the dual of the dual returns to the original? I see, that's an important point. We could associate a function x dot with the numerical vector x. So what corresponds to x dot? Let's denote this entity that exists in the dual of the dual space as x hat. If we were to discuss this rigorously, it would take a while. So I'll just write the result. Here's what the answer looks like. Ha, huh, what is this? Um, x hat looks like a function, but it's a function that maps another function f. And its value becomes f of x. I don't understand this at all anymore. It's okay, calm down. First, if we write the expression f of x on the right side using row and column vectors, it would look like this as an image. Ah, right, I remember that. Here, the function f is applied to the vector x. On the other hand, the expression x hat of f on the left side is applying the function x hat to the vector f. Intuitively, x hat is the double transpose of the column vector x. So it is still a column vector. And you can calculate the dot product by multiplying it with a row vector. So that's what it was. The rows of points and functions are swapped, right? The dual space, it's more formidable than I thought. Today we lightly touched on the topic of dual spaces, but it's a deep concept, so if you're interested, be sure to look into it. Well then take care everyone. See you next time.